Hey, this is Mr. W. This year's AP Bio exam is just two FRQs. The goal of this video is to help you get ready for the first one, experimental design. Let's do AP Bio Review FRQs. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that I'm doing live review sessions every Tuesday and Thursday between now and the AP Bio exam they're at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. They're on YouTube. I'll see you there. The link is below. Here's how the College Board describes what you'll have to do on question one of this year's AP Bio exam. It involves interpreting and evaluating experimental results. You'll be given a scenario accompanied by data in a table or a graph. You'll have to, one, describe and explain a biological concept, process, or model. Two, identify experimental design procedures three, analyze data with some type of calculation, and then four, make and justify a prediction. So how do you prepare for that? How are you gonna get yourself to a level where you can score that four or five that you're aiming for? In this video, I'll walk you through the skills that you'll need. Note that I've already done several videos about how to do part A, how to master biology content. Now let's talk about task B. Identify experimental design procedures. This involves a couple of skills. First, identifying dependent and independent variables. Second, identifying appropriate controls. And third, justifying appropriate controls. Let's start with how experiments work. Experiments have an independent variable and a dependent variable. The independent variable is what you're testing. The dependent variable is the measured outcome that results from whatever effect the independent variable brings about. Here's data from a study that measured the effect of temperature on respiration in a small species of fish that lives in the Atlantic Ocean. In this study, the independent variable is temperature. The dependent variable is the amount of oxygen that the fish consumes. The dependent variable always goes on the y-axis, and the independent variable goes on the x-axis. A properly designed experiment is a controlled experiment. The design allows you to test one thing, the independent variable. All other possible variables need to be controlled. So here's the overall structure of a controlled experiment. There's a control group and an experimental group. The experimental group is the one where your experimental subjects are exposed to your independent variable. Except for one difference, your control group should be exactly the same as your experimental group. The only difference is that the control group doesn't include your independent variable. The purpose of your experiment is to see if there's a difference between the results in your control group and your experimental group. If there is, you have a correlation between the presence of the independent variable and some observed outcome. Here's an example. Scientists wanted to measure whether exposure to secondhand smoke causes cancer in animals, like your dog or cat. To measure this, they used mice as an experimental subject. The first phase of the experiment ran for five months. They exposed 24 mice to filtered air and another 24 to environmental tobacco smoke, secondhand smoke. They measured the results. In the second phase of the experiment, they repeated the initial five months of exposure and then let both the control and experimental groups breathe regular air for another four months. What's the control group? The mice in filtered air. What's the independent variable? exposure to environmental tobacco smoke. What's the dependent variable? The incidence of tumors. All the other variables are controlled. They use the same strain of mice in both the control and the experimental groups. Both groups ate the same food. Their cages were at the same temperature. The goal is for the one difference to be the independent variable. Let's look at another cancer-related study designed to test the effectiveness of two drugs, we'll call them P and Q, on controlling cell proliferation, which is one aspect of cancer. Here's how to read a graph like this. If there's a plus sign on the row for that drug, it means that that drug is present in an experimental trial. If there's a minus sign, it means that the drug is absent. In this case, the dependent variable is the amount of cellular proliferation. Now in this experiment, what's the control group? It's group one, the group that's exposed to neither drugs. Here's another feature of a well-designed experiment, 
lots of trials, many experimental subjects, enough so that you can generate an average result and determine the spread of the data. And that leads us to our next topic, analyzing data with some type of calculation. In terms of data, a very important skill is understanding how error bars work. Like many AP classes, my class did the spinach leaf disc lab to learn about photosynthesis. In the version that we did, we compared the amount of photosynthesis that would result when spinach leaf discs were exposed to a 100 watt bulb and to a 60 watt bulb. We tried to control all of our variables so that the one difference was the intensity of the bulb. Here are our class results. From our results, we determined a mean, an average, and by comparing each value to the mean and incorporating the number of trials, we were able to compute what's called the standard error of the mean. I don't know what's gonna happen this year, but my guess is that what's more important than being able to calculate standard error is understanding how it shows up in error bars and graphs and what those error bars mean. Here's our data with error bars. What does this tell us? It tells us what our mean or average was. That's the height of the bar. And then the spread of the data above and below the mean. The most important thing to note is that the error bar for our 100 watt bulb treatment does not overlap with the error bar for the 60 watt bulb. That means that the difference between these two sets of data is statistically significant and that's the term that you should use if you're writing about this in an FRQ. Here's another example. A study was done on the effect of pesticides upon various aspects of the life history of different strains of bed bugs. The blue bars represent populations that were not exposed to the pesticide. In other words, that's the wild type. The orange bars show bed bugs that were grown for several generations in the presence of the pesticide. One part of the study looked at the effect of these pesticides on the percentage of bed bug eggs that were able to hatch. For the two strains shown, was there an effect? If you don't consider the error bars, you'll get the wrong answer. The blue bars are higher than the orange bars for both strains. But look at the error bars. Their range overlaps. That means there's not a statistically significant difference in egg hatching. A really tough challenge that happens on AP Bio FRQs is interpreting data from two or more different sources and then drawing conclusions and making predictions related to the underlying biology. Here's an example of the kind of problem that you might face. Malaria is a devastating disease that affects hundreds of millions of people worldwide. It's caused by a parasite that's spread by a mosquito. For years, pesticides like DDT have been used to control the mosquito, but the mosquitoes usually evolve resistance and the pesticides cause problems in terms of their effect on the environment and on human health. A group of researchers was interested in using a type of biological control, a fungus to control the mosquito. The problem was that the fungus itself was killed by exposure to ultraviolet light from the sun. So the researchers first had to genetically engineer the fungus so that the fungus could survive in ultraviolet light. Graph one shows the amount of DNA damage in the wild type fungus, WT, compared to the genetically engineered strain, TS, which stands for transgenic. Graph two shows the percentage of surviving mosquitoes after they were exposed to an oil-based spray, a spray containing the wild type fungus, and a spray containing the genetically engineered fungus. If this were an FRQ, you might be asked to identify the control group in graph two and explain the differences in the results from the three treatments. And as you did this, your job would be to connect what's going on in graph one to the results in graph two. Hit pause, give it a try. In graph two, the top line is the control. This is an oil-based spray without any fungus. It's a fungus-free standard for comparison, which is another way to think of a control. It's a standard for comparison that lacks the independent variable. The mosquitoes in this treatment are doing just fine, which is actually a bad thing. Remember that the goal is to control the spread of malaria, and you can only do that by killing the mosquitoes or interfering with their life cycle. In the treatment that's represented by the red line, some mosquitoes are dying because they've been infected with the wild-type fungus, 
but the bottom blue line, which has the transgenic fungi, shows much lower survival rates in the mosquitoes. Why is the transgenic strain so much more effective? You have to look at graph one for the answer. The transgenic strain of fungi can do something the wild type strain can't. Notice how from hours two to about five, both fungal strains suffer a lot of DNA damage. But then in the transgenic strain, starting between hours five and six, DNA damage actually goes down. If DNA damage is going down, then these fungi must be able to repair their DNA. So you can conclude by saying that the genetically modified transgenic strain of fungi can survive even when exposed to the sun's ultraviolet rays because they can repair their sun-damaged DNA. As these fungi survive, they infect and kill the mosquitoes, explaining the low mosquito survival rate in that treatment. Another aspect of dealing with data is doing calculations. A very common FRQ challenge is to calculate a rate of change. Here's a famous graph that was a key piece of evidence in elucidating the operon system of gene expression in bacteria, but we're not going to talk about that right now. What this graph shows is bacterial population density in a culture of bacteria over several hours. The y-axis is population density, the x-axis is time. So what's the rate of growth between seven and eight hours? Rate is the change in the y-axis over the change in the x-axis, you know, rise over run. So in this case, at seven hours, the cell density is 10 to the sixth power, which is one million. At eight hours, the cell density is 10 to the seventh power, which is 10 million. 10 million minus 1 million is 9 million. That difference occurred over one hour. So between hours seven and eight, the rate of growth was 9 million cells per hour. You can do this. At the time I'm making this video, there's so much time left. I know that the pandemic is making this so much harder, but if you put in the time, you can achieve your goal. Use the college board questions that I've told you about and the materials on my Biomania AP Bio preparation system, which you can access on sciencemusicvideos.com or you can download as an app for Apple and Android. I'll see you live on YouTube. Go to sciencemusicvideos.com, Mr. W Live. See you there. Thank you. Good luck. Stay safe.